here in first row, <laughs> leading us through the, through the buses and through the subway. Okay, I, I was um, thinking what to, to present today, uh, essentially, and I was somehow motivated for the, the discussions we had yesterday. So, in a way, you are going to see that uh, my presentation is complementary to this. Uh, uh, ideas that uh, I presented yesterday in, in, some, in some ways. So you will see some details and perhaps for the students who this, this, uh, the transparencies that later on will be in PDF also could help to, to understand a bit more of some of the things that we said yesterday. In general, that, uh, that uh, the, the basic idea that I want to stress is the, that once you have a quantum system has a behavior when it is coherent, but then when you add it, uh, an environment to it, many things could change radically. And then uh, for that, we have uh, to understand how a quantum system behaves by itself and how a big quantum system behaves, which were the, the, the things that we were discussing yesterday. So for me, and the, the, the idea that I, I got from yesterday, it's also, ah, I, to get the, I need a pointer. I forgot that. Maybe I didn't. Do you have a, I don't have a pointer, so it's perhaps, let's see. No, it's just, Mm. Uh, what happened is it, it's red, and I am not able to see red. That's uh, not to see very much. Any, anyway, I'm going to use the. I can put mine. No, I don't have the, the batteries. Mine. Ah. So one thing that I learned very, very early, and I learned it from, from, from P.W. Anderson, is that really you can jump from one system to the other. Remember this pioneering paper of Anderson on Anderson localization that was in the, in the 58th year, he considered sort of a tie-binding model for non-interacting particles, and that's what he considered that were fermions. But he said explicitly that the object C could be either harmonic oscillators, coordinates, electron operators, or spin, spinners. All the, th all the things could essentially will contain very uh, similar physics. Now that's, uh, that's just textual from P.W. Anderson. And that's uh, essentially what I'm going to, to address in this, uh, in this situation. So the things that I consider were, are electrons in a lattice, um, modes of an oscillator, there are spins, there could be also uh, use a similar phenomena to, to plasmonic oscillators. I mean, you have plasmons in nanoparticles, they interact the, the dipolar modes with each other, and since essentially they are coupled, um, uh, coupled oscillators. I, I should already show my, that this, I brought these ideas from the beginning in, in the set of experiments for the spin diffusion in a system, and I describe how it is possible to measure the self-correlation function in a crystal, and was, it seems to be diffusive. But our way to, to understand more things from that was really to go to the fermionic system because it was the case where we could solve easily. And even when we know that many body interaction will sort of trans, uh, modify that, but you have the, the essential structure already in the single particle description. And another thing that I, I learned quite immediately about the the first thing that I did as a, as a, as a doctoral student to address an, an environment was the Landauer black body idea. In Landauer uh, approach to transport, I, I discussed uh, in the first talk, I discussed a bit 
uh, Boltzmann equation, I discuss a uh, Kubo equation as a sort of Fermi Golden Rule. And there is a, a, a still an, a, an alternative uh, approach, which was the Landauer approach, in which the quantum system, you consider a closed quantum system, uh, and then you connect it to the electrodes, so essentially to the batteries here. And actually, in the Landauer's view, the environment is in the electrodes. So you have the system, and you see how this system will uh, respond to the electrode. And the idea is more or less that the electrodes, that the environment, uh, are an essentially a, a black body that is irradiating electron into the system that go out to the other side. And then, in that case, the current that you observe in, in, at, the, at the electrodes is essentially proportional to the transmission probability, the quantum mechanical probability from going from left to right. That could be calculated in the way that you are able to calculate. That's full quantum mechanics is here, scattering matrix. Uh, you could use scattering matrix, Green's functions, or many body um, propagators here. And then you're going to, to think how many of those uh, excitation of energy epsilon you have at the, at the left, for example, whether these excitations are really occupied, that's a Fermi, Fermi occup occupation function, you will know that uh, he considers essentially as one-dimensional contacts. So in those contacts, every electron or either goes to the left or to the right. Then you will have a, a one-half here to say of those electrons that you have, that's the density of states and the occupation number, only half go to the right. And then you, in order to compute the current, you have to put the, the electron charge and the, and the group velocity. And the current is a balance between what goes from left to right and the right to left. And this is your calculation. Then you do a linearization of this equation because you have to do an integral on energy. You integrate around the, the Fermi energy. And you end up essentially, because it is a one-dimensional system, with saying that the current is proportional to the, the quantum transmission probability and the voltage that the different in, 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 in chemical potential you come from left to the right. So current, it is conductance, is essentially the, uh, the quantum transmission probability. What, uh, in whatever way you could uh, calculate this. And then you have this quantum uh, um, electron charge and H bar there to, to, to evaluate. And then you probably you have seen this, this idea has percolated, and I think it is very fundamental because puts explicit emphasis on what is the system and what is the environment, that you open the system to the environment to see what you are going to calculate. Now the, then the point is, how are you going to, to say something about the system? Uh, like yesterday, let's consider the simplest system that you could uh, imagine. Two orbitals, which are coupled with the uh, probability amplitudes. That's uh, one energy in one side, an energy on another side. And this cal we did this calculation yesterday in the, in the blackboard. You have a two by two matrix. And this, um, you eliminate this, uh, one of the, of the equations in the other. And you're going to see that essentially this original uh, energy is renormalized by the presence of the second side. And you call to this a self-energy. From this, you have still the complete problem. No approximation here. You can do approximations if you forget the dependence of energy of this term, then you will have a, a, a perturbation theory. But if you comp have the complete dependence on, on the energy, that's still the complete problem. A problem. From this green function, you can calculate the density of states. We, we went through this uh, also yesterday very fastly. If you put a small imaginary part in the energy, and then these divergences, these poles, get uh, broadened a bit, and you use this broadening to evaluate, the, for example, the local density of states. And this, the local density of states will be the imaginary parts of the green function minus the imaginary part of the green function. That's Essentially, you have the poles broadened. And from this, you see that you have done, that's a decimation of pair partitioning, 
what you have done is solve this Dyson equation for, for this simple system in terms of the Ampertorf Green function. So the Ampertorf Green function uh, has a, an individual side here, an individual side there, and then you perturb with the probability amplitude to shun from one side to the other. Okay, there's a, a lot of things that you can build up open, open that, on that. And essentially, you could go to much more complex systems. Uh, here, for example, uh, you could obtain the, the time dependence of the probability if you put the particle in A to find it in B. It's just you have to do the, also the Fourier transform of the Green's function, and that you will obtain something that goes forth and back. And here I have uh, uh, correspond to an experiment that I'm going to show later. I have two spins. We put the spin in one uh, nuclei, and then we see what is the, pro uh, the polarization in the other nuclei, and we see that it oscillates. And this is because it uh, goes forth and back, and because I, I have an environment of other spins, this decoheres, and finally this, is the, this Rabi oscillation is at, is attenuated. Similar thing will happen with, with uh, phonons or whatever system that you have. Now we want to go a bit farther. We did it yesterday. For example, imagine that we have a, a chain which is a longer chain, 100 atoms. And in this chain, of, I described how to, it is the exact uh, solution of this chain. But again, I could do it, I add an at atom, a surface state, or uh, another atom here, which is weakly coupled to the rest of the chain, I will have a self-energy, which is this. The first term is the, the hopping, and then you have the continuous fraction here. And you do, again, you can do either the, the Fourier transform of the Green's function, or can, you can put the eigenfunctions and, and, and whatever. And notice what you ob obtain here. You observe that the probability to find the particle in the in the surface state, it decays as a function of time. But while it decays, it goes, the probability goes to the rest of the chain, gets, gets propagated here, and gets reflected in the, in the edge of the chain, because it is a finite chain at, at site 100, gets reflected, and goes back as a mesoscopic echo. That is the, the, the first thing that that I mentioned that we tried to measure experimentally this mesoscopic echo was the first idea that we say, okay, there is something wrong with this experiment of Ernst because they didn't have the experiment, the mesoscopic echo. And the point was too much the coherence because they put magnetic impurities in the system. We didn't. So in our system, essentially the dynamics, the main dynamics occur within the ring, and then we were able to observe this mesoscopic bit the, the, the Poincaré cycle that corresponds to the excitation going around the ring and uh, it goes around and goes back to the initial site will correspond to this time scale here. Essentially, we don't have a big return probability because there is also the probability escape to the other rings in the whole crystal. So there is, you could consider the whole crystal as a decoherence process to this simple uh, dynamics of the polarization within the ring. Uh, I mentioned in my previous talk that this experiment was better done in a system where they don't have the, 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 the coherence of the environment because it was already in a liquid, in a molecule in a liquid, that's an experiment made by, by Ernst, and they observed the decay of this excitation that they put in the edge, that's a, that's a chain, they put the excitation in one edge, goes to the second side, to the second carbon, to the third carbon, and so on. Notice that it is really many body dynamics, because even when I, I map it to, to a single particle, they really they are interacting spins. In these spins, he is sort of get rid of the, um, of the easing interaction that will be really many body interaction. Uh, he did a part se sequence to get rid of this interaction that we were not able to do it in the solid state uh, experiment that I showed you before. So in the previous experiment was a crystal. Here it is a molecule. In the molecule, he was able to get rid of this dipolar interaction uh, of the um, Eisen term, which will be the many-body interaction here. So that's why the dynamics is exactly equal 
to the dynamics in a, in a linear chain uh, of oscillators. Let's go a, still a further step. About this non-exponential, non uh, uh, the decay. We saw that apparently the decay was exponential. And here I have this uh, 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 a paper by Mateos, uh, Mateos Moszynski, Mark, Marcus Moszynski, or Mateus. Marcus Moszynski, yes. And the, the, that was the decay in a, with a, def, uh, a lot of mathematics to, to, to try to, to obtain the, the resonance spectrum, uh, the time evolution in a, in a, of a resonance state in, in a system that they, they consider was a model for a nuclear. That's what this, the sort of thing that Moszynski was, was interested. And then let, let me consider a situation that is somehow re re related to that. That's the vertical polarization and the horizontal polarization in, in, a, in a piano string. In a piano string, you, you beat with a, with a hammer the, the string, and the, the, the system starts to oscillate. And you, what you are going to observe with the sound is, is, a, is a, like this. I, 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 this is an experimental uh, curve for an actual piano, so you see that after the hammer, the sounds start decreasing with an exponential, and there is, then there is this long time, that's a, it's another exponential, and this other exponential corresponds. You have the initial decay of this, because you give the, the energy into, the, into the, the string, but then the string moves the, the harmonic box, and the harmonic box returns some a probability amplitude because it still the, the harmonic box is vibrating, and then it is the harmonic ball, box what keeps the, the string vibrating, feeding the vibration. So the, the time scale you see here is another exponential or could be a power law that corresponds to the, how the sound is um, decreasing the harmonic ball, box. That's a, an interesting, a very interesting thing between the uh, feedback between the string and the harmonic box has a, is a continuous. That's an environment for the, for the string. And see that depends on where you are standing, sometimes you see also this decay, which are many orders of magnitude, which is sort of interference of the, of the oscillation, at least in the, in the sound that you are measuring. Interference between the sound that came directly from the string from the, the first uh, excitation of the string, and that, that is returning from the harmonic bo box. And at this point is that you put the pedal, the, the damping pedal, and the, you kill the, the sound over there. Ah, I have to do this. So, could it uh, appear something like that in this experiment that, that, that I showed you uh, before? Yes. So the complete calculation of the model that I showed before is this. I did it with a, with a student, uh, Dr. Student Elena Rufail Fiori at the time. And this is what you will obtain in the, the linear chain. You will have the, the, the exponential decay. In this region, you have this qu uh, quantum Zeno regime, which is the quadratic uh, decay that you don't even notice, but it, the Dynamics always has to be start quadratically. Then you see this, this exponential, and then you hit this survival collapse. In this time, that where uh, the the survival probability changes in three orders of magnitude here, and then you enter the regime of quantum diffusion. That's a, a very uh, an infinite uh, change, so there is no uh, echo, no no mesoscopic echo here. And the time of the mesoscopic echo will correspond essentially to something that has to do with the number of uh, sites that you have in the, in the chain. That could be the, the Poincaré recurrence, and in the, in the chain is infinite, this time it will be infinite. And essentially, when you observe the, the survival collapse, and then that's uh, the interesting thing, and that's uh, at this point, there is almost no chance to, fi to find the particle in, in, the, in the original site. Hmm? That's Quite, uh, and again, what is uh, um, the time scale of this, uh, of this uh, survival is of the order of um, 
1 over, this is the local density of states, at the, the density of directly connected states to the initial state. That's in 1, is the density of directly connected states. Uh, to what states, what is the density of states in the, in the state to work, towards which the initial state is decaying. So the initial state connects with, with any, some states in the, in the chain, and this is what is uh, decaying. Right. No, they call it, that's a regime, if you interrupt this here, then it will not uh, evolve, that's what it means. But it's, 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 it's a, uh, they call the, the quantum Sino regime, but it's, well, it's going to occur, the quantum Sino. That's a quadratic decay. But that's, uh, but most of literature use this, this uh, that's, uh, they call the regime where quantum Sino could occur. If you were able to uh, interrupt this dynamic, then you would, won't have dynamics, or very little dynamics. See, it's, yes, quantum Sino effect. Yes, that's that. Quantum Sino effect means that if you interrupt here, then uh, it didn't evolve, al almost didn't evolve. So essentially, you interrupt continuously, and then doesn't evolve at all. But for that, you need just the quadratic decay, but it's... Uh, lattice unit, in the, yes. So, and this is the, the group velocity or Lieb Robinson bound for the, for the system, if you, if you want. So I call it always the group velocity, but it's the, the, you did a, a great deal of stuff uh, on how to, to sort have bounds for this. And again, that depends on the systems uh, we are able to observe the, in polarization that decays with, with this exponential, essentially when the environments are more or less uh, complex, that's, a, that's a, a, a case where I see an exponential decay for many orders of magnitude. That's a, a Fermi golden rule in the practice for, for one of the systems uh, of interacting spins. But the main point, again, is that when you have an infinite system, you have now this sort of non-Hermitian dynamics, because it's a dynamics where in your system you put this self imaginary self-energy. So the imaginary self-energy represents all the, the whole environment, and then you have non-Hermitian dynamics inside. Of course, if you have to conserve the probability inside, then you have to do something beyond the non-Hermitian dynamics. You have, have to go a Limblatt or Keldish that I'm going to describe a bit. And again, and how to do this? For example, for me again, inspiration of that, on how to do that, how to do... Um, beyond the, the non-Hermitian dynamics was the idea of Bütiker. Bütiker said, okay, in this situation where you have a sample, you go from the left to the right, if you have a voltmeter here, a voltmeter will take electrons from the system and will have to return for every electron that takes away, he has to return an electron because in a voltmeter there is no current. The condition of a voltmeter is measuring the, the, the particles without having a current. That's a, that's a condition. Then you will do with a scattering matrix or with green function, whatever you want. You go from the left to the right directly, or you go through the voltmeter. And you have the voltmeter. The way to put the voltmeter here is to put a self-energy, an escape through the voltmeter. And then the voltmeter will put an additional condition, which is that the voltmeter is going to return here, this is the equation of the balance of the current, that just as before, it's essentially the Ohm's law, but then you have to put, uh, you have to do Kirchhoff equations, you have to return the, um, the electron that entered the voltmeter, so the current is zero. So the condition of zero current here, zero current is of the, you go, you go from left to the voltmeter, from left to the voltmeter, proportional to the chemical potential in the left, the, from the voltmeter to the left, proportional to the chemical potential in the voltmeter, and the same from the right, and then you have to evaluate the, the voltmeter condition so the, the current is zero. If when you do that, you have a transmission probability from left to right, which has two components. One, it is the co cohesion component, go directly from left to right, surviving, surviving the entrance to the voltmeter. And then I go from the left to the voltmeter, and then from the voltmeter to the right, and this is the incoherent term. So that's the way you could do immediately to go beyond 
uh, non-Hermitian dynamics because you compensate reintroducing the particles that are, are lost in the system. And this is something that I did with my first uh, doctoral student, who was uh, Jorge D'Amato, who is sort of develop a description in which at every side we have a, a sort of voltmeter that will escape through some imaginary parts in the, in the, in the self-energies, and uh, we have to return it. And once you, we return it, we get a general equation that you could enter in uh, every side, and essentially a total transmission probability from left to right will, con will be uh, sum of two terms, going directly from left to, to right, and then doing many jumps in, in the between, and all these jumps between voltmeters are described by transmission probabilities by the Green's functions of the, of the, uh, of the system. So essentially, your Hamiltonian plus the voltmeter is, um, is what is evaluating, uh, giving your the, the inputs in this equation. This is a self-consistent equation that could be, essentially, it's a Bethesdahl-Petter equation, because this involves, this transmission, involves two Green's functions, the, the retarded and the advanced, and essentially the escape from the left and escape from the right. All the, the transmission probabilities you have here have this, this way. Do you have two Green's functions, a retarded and an advanced one? And so this essentially can be built up in a whole formalism in terms of Keldish uh, that um, essentially you will say, that an initial density that you have here, you have a, a, a density, a wave, the, the, a wave function with the conjugate and the, the wave function, the normal wave function, so you have density here. Each term will evolve, this will evolve with the green, retarded green function, this will evolve with the advanced green function, and with this, you get the final um, density. But what happens if this green function that's calculated with a system that has an environment, that has these voltmeters, then it will contain terms uh, that escape. So those terms were the, the imaginary parts of the green function. You reinject them in the self energy here. And this is essentially the, this is the coherent term that I show you in, in this uh, Bittiker approach. This is a coherent term. And this is the incoherent term where you return to the system all the, all the particles that have interacting with the environment, with the voltmeter or, or with electron phonons, or with other electrons and that, uh, in processes that you describe in a sort of mean field uh, approximation. And now this, this term, uh, this description, what uh, the advantage is that allows you to do a time-dependent description because you have all the time dependencies in the, in the Green's function through the, the, their dependence in the energies, and then you can do, really calculate how long does it take a, a particle that enters for, from the left to go to the right, and then you have the quantum dynamics all in uh, here. This is, uh, this is an alternative to the Limblatt equation for the density matrix. So you obtain essentially the same, if you use scale, this is probably because you prefer to uh, describe better the, the Fermi energy region because you can describe simultaneously position, times, and energies in, uh, within this scale dish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but you can go beyond, because I can do beyond the, here, I, we did it sometimes, uh, beyond the Markovian approximation. If you, in general, you keep these self-energies with a dependence on, on energy, then you give memory to the interaction with the environment. But uh, it will complicate a bit the things, uh, depends on what uh, you want to solve. You could do the, the Markovian or non-Markovian. So I'm not going to, to stress uh, much below, but this is the, the way that we do essentially the calculations of this. Uh, this a spin system with uh, all the spins, they have an occupation one half, and I have an excitation, but I said the occupation spin up is with probability one, and then I see how this excess of probability evolves as a function of time. And what we do is we solve this, this equation uh, 
either in a single body or in a many body case. Uh, I'm going to show a solution. It's not, um, it's not that I, I, I want to go into the details of this here, only show the, um, more or less the, 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 the example. So the difficulties that limited the application of this generalized landauer bittiger equation, which is this linearized scale dish, is essentially that I have to, um, the, the problem that to do uh, numerically is that I have to integrate over, over the, let's see, that's in the, yes, I have to integrate over all previous histories, and this could be very cumbersome. So we did it in a few cases, but, uh, the cases that we could do analytically, it, it's fine, and, but then numerically it's quite complicated. That's uh, because uh, too much memory there. And then we have to use it for, for the following case. Remember that I tell you that the, our way to inject probability into the proton system was having the probability in the carbon and introducing it into the proton. That is a swap gate because we have the information in the carbon, we put the interaction uh, between the carbon and the proton, and see, uh, and that use this to, to introduce the, the uh, to, to inject the polarization in the proton system, and at a later time, we use the same gate to put, uh, get the whatever uh, polarization is left in, in a proton to transfer back into the carbon so we could, could measure. So we needed to, to optimize this gate, this swapping gate between the carbon and the proton. That's a gate. So the way that the gate works is a sort through the radio oscillation and the decoherence, as you see here. And then we have to stop there, and then we try to, to address how, how to do best do this, this, uh, this swap gate. And essentially for that, we, we use, uh, we um, fit the frequency here, that's uh, the frequency, the, the, um, here I have the frequency, as a function of the orientation of the sample. As I said, the, the, the interaction between the carbon or the proton depends on the orientation of the crystal inside the magnet. And so I change in here the orientation with the magnet. I was expecting in certain orientation to be in the magic angle at which there is no interaction, and so the frequency will be zero. Mm? That's what we were expecting. Still, when we did the experiment with different orientations, we obtained that there was a whole region where the frequency was zero. In the meantime, in the fitting of this, of the attenuation of this exponential, which is this, depends very little on the orientation, but in this region where it was zero, the, 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 the relaxation was becoming infinite. So that's almost zero relaxation. So really, we didn't, couldn't understand the experiment at, at the beginning. And essentially say, OK, we are going to work here <laughs> where it is maximum. We have a faster swap and, and essentially no uh, lit, the little attenuation. We work here. And we thought that this was a, a fitting problem. But then I remember again the problem of the piano. Let's go, I'll go back to the piano. You have the piano, it's not, you don't have a single chord, but you have a triples or double chords. Hmm? And then the question is why a piano can be tuned? Imagine that you have one chord that is already tuned. And then you are trying to tune up the second chord by uh, you're having a, a, a screw here, you're changing the screw. And then at this point, you expect that this is going to be tuned. But you're a physicist, and your physicist, and you did the standard courses of physics, physics okay, they say, no, it can't be tuned. Why? Because there are two modes of frequency. They should have some interaction. They always, two modes, uh, quantum uh, states or modes, uh, vibration modes, should have some interaction. And if you have any interaction at all, you will expect avoided crossings. That's a situation that a physicist will expect. <laughs> a physicist will think, in principle, that, that the system could not be tuned. Still, what happens is this. There is a whole region here where it's self-tuned. And why is it that? 
it is because the interaction between the two charts came through the harmonic box. So energy is given into the harmonic box, and the harmonic box is given the energy to the other chart. So you are dealing essentially with a non-hermitian system, non-hermitian system, and the interaction is through this environment. Non-hermitian means that you have this box with infinite degrees of, uh, of freedom, of all resonant, and the, on this, all this region, you, you, you are having the sort of cell tune. If you go to see the, 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 the uh, lives of these modes, essentially you will see there is one mode that uh, sort of uh, lives almost forever, very long time, and another which is very fast mode. Of course, it in, in depends on the situation. It, maybe this is not exactly the, the, a single line, but you have uh, some that will be a non-ideality because if the two frequencies, uh, if the model is not perfect, you're going to have this situation. But essentially, it's, it's the same as this. So the two strings synchronize themselves. That's, uh, that's quite, quite, ah. And how do you describe this? As I, as I mentioned before, the way to, to describe this is simply, but for example, with the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. You have an energy, another energy, and the happening. And I say, if one of the modes is a, a, a coupled with an environment, so it's a, an imaginary part, this is, again, in a Markovian approximation. I put just no dependence on the energy of this thing. And then the, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian is going to be, first, no, no imaginary part here. That would be the, the, bonding, the bonding and anti-bonding. But as you increase the interaction with the environment, this mode, this pulse goes to the complex plane. You have a, an exceptional point, and you have a mode that moves to the right, another to the left. This is the, the, the short-lived one, and this is the long-lived one. That's what we, you would expect. In harmonic oscillators, you, you do chains of harmonic oscillators, and depends on the, on the length of the, of the chains, you will see whether it is a, a sort of phase transition or, or, or not. You are approaching a phase transition here. And those, uh, that's uh, more or less already what you have the situation in the, in the, in the oscillator. You could solve, again, as I said, uh, the, the, here we solve the, the Keldish equation for the quantum champs. We put the polarization in one side. That's what we did in, for, for the experiment. We have the, these, these two propagators, and we have the interaction with the environment with the second term. We uh, solve it instead of doing the. With, at that time, we realized that it's, instead of uh, integrating over all the previous times, that that's what we did uh, initially, we should have kept the, the whole um, density matrix, with the, with, which is the, the lesser green function or density matrix, the non diagonal terms already contain the, the memory of the system. So you could go we were able to go in time steps. So essentially, this is the initial condition. It evolves into a sort of superposition, and then this superposition is, you can think that whenever it's measured by the environment, interacting with the environment, it's being collapsed into one state, and so could collapse into this state, into this, or into the superposition, and so on. And from that is what... Uh, we, we were able to solve this analytically in that case. So from that, what we learned is the following. That essentially, this integral uh, Keldish equation could be solved by a simpler trotter revolution and uh, considering the environment in sort of quantum champs. And from that quantum champs, we still conceive the idea that we, at every time, we are, were really this uh, density function was accounting for all these histories, uh, the superposition of all the possible histories. And then we decided to, to use this as a, as, a, as a tool to calculate the really many body dynamics. I will not go into the details. But after that, we developed this uh, method, which is quantum parallelism to, to do the uh, spin dynamics. Nowadays, what we do with spin dynamics is the following. 
we consider an initial state, which is a, a superposition of all the states in the ensemble, and we do a, a dynamics of, of this single state, and this is enough to, to evaluate the observables that we want. Okay, and this is what uh, the oscillation in the swap gate that we that I showed before, in, but in, in more detail, that's the probability, the polarization was oscillating with time, this is time. These are different crystal orientations. The, the, so the maximum of the oscillation will give sort of the period, half of the period. The period is, is this, this is time scale, so this will be the period. There is a whole region where the frequency is zero or the period diverges. And the solution of the Keldish equation without any free parameter, any free parameter, because we have all this interaction from first principles and uh, interaction with the environment given by the Fermi Golden Rule, and that's what we have here. And essentially, there is a, a full phase diagram that depends on whether the interaction is uh, between the, 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 the spins is just easing, if it is flip flop or it is uh, dipolar. Uh, the, these are essentially details on how the transition could, be, could appear. In our experimental case that corresponds to this, uh, this is quantum, in the, now here it is quantum sinophase because as a consequence of the quadratic decay, if the environment is, is measuring the system, is collapsing the system very frequently, then there is no dynamic at all. And the, that's the case in where the, there is no flip-flop because the environment is sort of capturing one of the spins and does not allow it to, to couple with the, with, the, with the carbon. Essentially, in this experiment, there was the carbon which was isolated and the proton that will see the other protons. So one of them will feel the environment, while the other could stay more or less without the environment. So it corresponds to this asymmetric case that I showed before. Uh, so in that case, if the environment interacts very strong with uh, this uh, first uh, proton, then will not, uh, there will be no transfer from the carbon to the proton. So the environment is able to capture one spin and kill it. So that does really, it is a quantum Zeno effect. No evolution is possible because of the environment. That uh, corresponds to what we saw in the experiment. Of course, uh, as I mentioned before, one interesting thing is that the, this exceptional point occurs only if, when the environment uh, is in one of the, uh, of the states, not in both. Because the usual thing is you have a Green's function, you put the poles and they put imaginary terms in, in, the, in the energies, and you put imaginary terms in the energies, the poles just, the, the eigenstates just move into the complex plane, which is the usual situation. The unusual situation appears uh, before because we put the machinery part only in one of them. But if you go to, to the Limblatt operator or to the Keldish operator for density matrix, where you have here the argument is energy, here the angle argument is frequency, it's not the same frequency and, 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 and energy. Frequency is, is different among energies. That's, this frequency has to do with the real dynamics of the observable. And then, if you have, for example, the, this situation that will correspond to having imaginary parts in both of them, terms will correspond, for example, to have an easy interaction with the environment in both of the spins. In that case, you still have a phase transition and the lean bladian uh, case. So for the, for, the, for the density Green's function, they are here, you, you have this um, exceptional point. So, if you do, if you have the phase transition already at the Hamiltonian level, it will survive to the density uh, description. But you may have a transition in the density description that is not uh, obvious in the, at the Hamiltonian level. The observable thing is always at the density description. That's what's important. So, and let me show again uh, some, what, what we did. Uh, we put, uh, again, just a very simple dynamics, two by two by two. 
And then we put fluctuations that essentially uh, projective measurements on the sides. That could be the oscillation. Because you have these projective measurements, you have attenuations. And if you study, for example, that's what, what we saw. We couldn't do this experiment, but that, uh, with, here it has numerically, we could do the time reversal. This, is the, this curve is the Lojmiteko. How much do you recover when you do dynamics and then dynamics backwards in the presence of an environment? And what you see, interesting, is already that decoherence, so the decay of the, of the, of the Lojmiteko occurs whenever the environment is acting on the, on the entangled state. So it is the entangled state which is uh, sensible to the environment, while, while uh, the polarization in this is in the pointer state, whether in one spin or in the other, more or less the Lojmiteko does not decay. Yeah. So the main of the decay, which is the exponential, occurs while the system is going through the superposition. So a superposition is in the midway when, when it's, it is uh, rotating from, from one orientation to the other orientation. You start with a, with a pointer state, and then you go into a superposition to, and, uh, in the midway to, to, the, to the swap. You are in a superposition, and that's uh, the moment when the, the, the system is, is sensible to the coherence. Hmm? And with this description, of course, we reobtain the, the chemical... And uh, just uh, because I, I mentioned yesterday, I said a molecule that is interacting with, with a substrate, there is a point that uh, typically you have, this is, the substrate will be a, a transition metal, in transition metal you have energies that, a band of energy correspond to the S-band, and as a, a narrow band that corresponds to the D-levels. Now, the bonding of the molecule typically falls. The bonding is outside, below the D level, and the antibonding is up, up uh, on top of the, of, the, of the D band. But then, as you get close, you get a resonance inside that is correspond to this state uh, interacting with the D band. We have a resonance state and, uh, and another resonance state. They are moving. And these states move inside the band, and the, 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 um, the breaking of the molecule corresponds when you don't have no longer here this, this go into a critical value. Because in that moment is when this state that was first the bonding between A and B has been transformed essentially into a bonding between the, 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 the atom A. And, uh, and D1, that so essentially no longer bonded. It's, it's mainly uh, the, the, the way the eigenstate is mainly the state A and a very bit of, uh, of, uh, of the D metal. Uh, so this is the moment when the, the molecule breaks down. That's essentially how, since I discussed yesterday, this a bit, this. And then let me shall finish with something with another experiment which is not mine. How to use out of our order correlations to, to measure dynamics in an interacting system. And in this system, I, was, uh, I wanted to, uh, in numerics, you cannot do very big numerics unless it is one dimension. And then we are going to put uh, interactions. So in our system, uh, I have in the, in the next transparency probably. Uh, the, the interaction I have here, the, the, the system is, I have the, the, the flip-flop processes between the spins, that is the equivalent, you can think as, as, as flip-flop or you can write it like that. You have the many body terms, which are the easy interactions, etc., etc., that you can, can write in terms of uh, uh, up and lower operators for the spins. That's in order to make obvious that it is a, a, a many-body interaction. And you have a local um, energy, which is essentially a cosine that, um, uh, with an incommensurate uh, wave vector. This is uh, the Hofstadter model, because this Hofstadter model is, is a, I, I was trying 
I was going to look for the, for the spectrum today, is the Book of Tatter butterfly. Uh, you have seen probably the, this fractal butterfly. Just in this butterfly, when the, the period is incommensurate, you're going to have, it's not, neither localized nor extended. So you have dynamics is diffusive there. That's qu quite interesting. And then you have a diffusive system, which is not chaotic, but it is uh, closest to chaotic that I, I could have, which is diffusive in one-dimensional system. And I can add oh, uh, interactions over heat. So what is the way to, uh, to study this many-body system? It could be very complex. So we devised it uh, at, this, at this pole sequence that we, we didn't implement it in, uh, experimentally yet, but we did it numerically. That means that we have a, an initial excitation here. That's a put uh, in one direction, one of the spin. The other could be in any, in, in any way. This excitation, we let it to, to, to evolve. After a certain time of the evolution, we apply a perturbation, which is a phase, changes the phase, is depending. It's a phase that depends on the position on the lattice. That's the perturbation. Depends on the position of the, of the lattice. That's a, like a, a, a gradient field that will put different phases to the spins that are uh, in the center and, and those in the left and, and, and in the top and the other in the bottom. And then I do the time reversal and I see how, um, what is the probability to return to the initial site. But then I do the Fourier transform of these probabilities as a function of the different phases uh, gradients that I put. So this is the way that my local observable, again, will have information of how much spread was the, the excitation. So always I have to, it's not that I could go and measure at site. I, I do local measurements, always at the initial site, and I could get know uh, how far did go. And essentially what I measure is proportional to the, um, is pro the results proportional to the, um, inverse participation ratio. To the, to the wave function, I could, I could know to the uh, wave functions at, at, the, at, the, at the fourth. So essentially, one of the coherences, uh, the coherence order zero of this is the inverse participation ratio. And I see that as a function of this order, I have the, uh, this, this phase transition here. Very, very, very clear here. If I try to measure it an edge, because the, the, there are these edge states, surface states, which are very messy, it not, will not work. But if you do in the center, it works perfectly. It does not depend uh, much on the realization, the particular phase of the realization of your system. And then we do that, and we could measure the essentially many-body localization, how it goes to the, from, uh, this is disorder, this is interaction, essentially this is the phase transition for disorder, and how does it move into the, into the interaction space, for example. But one thing that is very interesting for me is the following. Again, I have this uh, the zero order coherence that measures the inverse participation ratio. Maybe you saw this, this picture before in other contexts. What's the interesting thing is that from this, uh, uh, I can measure the also the, the, the survival probability, and I see that this survival probability is in the region, this is, for example, in the region as a function of disorder. As a function for disorder, the critical value is more or less here. And I have different values of the interaction. If the interaction is zero, the, the, the dynamic starts like uh, all quantum dynamics in a linear chain being what I call quantum diffusive, uh, that's, or super diffusive, that's very fast escape, which has a ballistic quantum, that could be ballistic. But once I enter in the region of uh, where it is, uh, uh, where I have diffusion, uh, that's where I have here the, the value of, of, of diffusion, the, the exponent, and essentially I, I add more interaction, and the, when you have interaction, uh, it stables, makes the diffusive uh, region stable. So essentially, my point is uh, you can think the many-body interactions as a, a, a decoherent process that stabilizes the quantum diffusion. And then if the uh, disorder is very strong, you go into the uh, many-body localization here. 
That's the region that it is subdiffuse. But look how uh, stable is the diffusive region towards, uh, um, towards um, inter many body interactions. Yes. 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 No, no, because uh, they are all uh, observable, uh, are local, so it's, uh, all it's uh, norm na naturally normalized. Because uh, that's uh, one uh, thing that uh, when you have an observable which is local, everything's came out normalized automatically. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. With respect to the to the, the to the the Fourier transform, with respect to different phases, the different gradients. Yes. See. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Nothing, no, 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 that's, uh, that's uh, you get better and better results, but uh, everything, that's another thing, that's whenever you do local things, everything is normalized from the beginning, but so you're getting better results, you will be uh, more trustable, but essentially that's, uh, they do not change too much. For example, here, I have 19, this is this curve, 51 is this, 200 sites, I have almost just the, the perfect phase transition. So the, if the system is small, you have more noise. And now that's a very recent experiment. It's related, but it's not the same technique. They use an, another form of uh, out of time order correlators. That's uh, Norman Chow and my collaborator, Paola Capellaro at MIT. He's from, from Berkeley. What well, they did experiments in, in fluor apatite. We did uh, our experiment before in hydroxyapatite. So there are almost one dimensional systems. In this one dimensional system, you have fluoride. They, they study the dynamics along the fluoride here. And the point they use this phosphorus here, they use this phosphorus as, which are there, as an impurity. They, they can turn on the interaction, the easy interaction of this fluoride with the, with the, with the fluoride uh, in order to put the local disorder. So I, I, in my theoretical case, I put this... Uh, a cosine interaction to, in order to represent disorder. They have an actual disorder uh, turning on the interaction between the, the fluoride and the phosphide here. So they could go from a quantum dynamics along the chain to a disorder quantum dynamics and they, they also can turn on the interactions. So in the non-interacting, they will have quantum dynamics, so, uh, and the sequence they use is not the gradient that we use, but a double quantum. In the, in the double quantum system is this flop-flop and flip-flip in the Hamiltonian that also allows you to, to measure how, how uh, does the wave function extend. And you see if this is non-interacting, they will have this quantum dynamics. And when they have a, a disorder system, that's, that's a, the pole sequence, in disorder system they see these diffusive regimes uh, because of the disorder. And they don't, and here they turn a bit the, the interaction. This, this, uh, the, the experiments are really quite involved in a way, but essentially they are doing the same physics that we have been describing uh, uh, before. They are seeing the, the, the dynamics, the, the ballistic dynamics, the diffusive dynamics, and then they put some uh, interact, interactions here, and in, in, they still have the, the ballistic dynamic, the diffusive dynamic, which is the, what I was saying. And essentially, just to end up with uh, one, one, one minute, one transparency, just I could end with this. I said, now we are doing uh, with my colleagues, uh, uh, Luca Celardo and Fausto Borgonovi, we say, okay, how, robust is the diffusion against decoherence. 
And then we consider again the, the, the harper hofstadter model. We consider a uh, um, Fibonacci model. The Fibonacci model, also you have a sequence, like a, in an in a A, B, A, B, in a, in a sequence that forms a Fibonacci sequence, an incommensurate, which is incommensurate, and also dynamics is diffusive. And still, this, uh, um, the power law band random matrix, which is again a random matrix that has a long range interaction with a power law. And this uh, is known to be chaotic there, and also known to be diffusive, clearly. And in all these systems, in all the regimes where it is, uh, you can go in the power band random matrix from value on uh, exponent with from 1 to 1 through 3, which are in the regime where it is chaotic and diffusive. And you see the diffusion, the diffusion constant is always very robust, very stable, as long as you are in the diffusion constant. For example, that's a, that's a completely universal curve. This is, a, this is I'm sorry, this is for the, for, the, for the Harper, so it's only robust. You are changing the, the coherence, that's a, the coherence strengths. As you move the decoherent strengths, your the whole region where diffusion does not depend on the decoherent strengths. Until the decoherence is so strong that's not allowed the, uh, uh, an excitation to jump to the next neighbor. Which is this jump, the, the individual jump is interrupted, then it's when you are going to notice that decoherence is there. But they are this is a completely universal feature of the diffusion. And again, you may think this, this curve at this. But as I mentioned, I started my, my lecture saying, OK, what is resistivity as a function of temperature? Temperature is the same as having the coherence. And then resistance will go to, the, to this regime, which is more or less like this. Hmm? That corresponds, that's the same the diffusion. This is the is inverse of diffusion. Again, you have this. I end up. <laughs> with the same curve that I started in the first transparency. So we are very still, this paper, paper is still in, uh, in referral, but I, I'm very happy with that. And the Loge Mitek also has a, 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 a regime where it depends on the, on the diffusion, uh, on the, um, only on the diffusion and not on the environment. But this is more, more, more trivial. So in summary, I hold, again, more or less in time. We observe experimentally that the dynamics of a swap gate has a phase transition to a frozen regime, to a quantum zero regime. And this is a consequence, the consequence of, observation of the observation by the environment, which produces this uh, bifurcation, which is a, um, an exceptional point in the spectrum of the Hamiltonian and of the spectrum of the Limbladian also. That's already in the Hamiltonian there is a the, the exceptional point, and there is also an exceptional point in the Limbladia. And the surprise is, okay, uh, mm, well, that's, that's, that's uh, the, 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 for me, the main thing is that the environment can modify the things in, in, in a substantial way, that you, it's not just adding uh, attenuations to the things that you saw before, but you have new uh, behaviors. And now these things of quantum dynamic phase transition is being observed in everything, in every, everywhere. So more or less could be all. That's my wife with whom we did all the, the experiments. Uh, so I want to devote uh, the talk for her. That's our experimental group, and that's uh, our sponsor, Richard Ernst, with whom we started this, these discussions. Yeah. Uh, but let's... So I remember that it was that this is, uh, uh, slide that you showed a uh, spin chain, right? And mm -hmm. with uh, fixed boundaries. And you like say, okay, there is this echo that happens because 
the, the, the spin, like spin excitation will move, then reflect and then go back. But like that will actually will happen like anyways if you have like a quite like strong dynamics because what you're doing is you have if you propagate a, a spin mode you will have like a right mode and a left mode and right. if you have fixed boundaries well the left the, the right mode or the left mode will like bounce and go back right so it's not will be will be done like more accurately to to talk about the 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 poker recurrences when you have like bone like closed boundaries when your like wave packet the left and the right modes will what? spread out and then after a time proportional that leads to the to the uh, near the, the Heisenberg time will yes. recover and back. Well, both, both of them, the time scale is, is the Heisenberg time. That's a, so that's a more or less the same. If you're in, in a ring, in our experiment, we were in a ring. So we have the excitation here. Yeah. Initially, this excitation spreads into the velocity. Yeah. Each one with this going, go around and go back. Yeah, but for example, if you have disorder, each... Ah, each once you have disorder, that's, that will be we are closer to the diffusive, and it will be less probable to see this, the, 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 this Heisenberg recurrence. Yeah, but for because example, okay, okay, yeah. In, in general, that there will be more diffusive, essentially. In order to have real Heisenberg the, the, uh, recurrences, I mean, will work in a chaotic system. In a chaotic system, it will work, that's uh, what uh, Ilda saw, because the levels, you, you have essentially the same spacing, and the Heisenberg time will, will be related mm -hmm. to this, uh, to, the, to the mean level spacing. If you are in disorder system, you have too many frequencies, and then you won't see uh, that clear. So, point carrier recurrences will occur, but it will not be as clear. Okay, but you will still call a point carrier recurrency the fact that you have a mode bouncing and returning back. Right. Okay. See, the bouncing is also, uh, for me, it's, uh, because that is not even like in a long time scale, because that time scale will be only this. The, the, the length of the lattice divided well by the, the, right. the velocity of the Yes, yes, the yes. Yes. Right. yes. That is like not long time scales, so are rather like short time. Well, not short, but. That's uh, for the single particles, it's a long time. For, for the, uh, in the real many body system, I don't. Uh, okay. it, it will be more, um, more difficult. But in any case, not that uh, I think that really should not expect very long times effect because, I mean, the coherence gets immediately inside. So there, there will be no... Uh, we could think about this mesoscopic echo because we thought that the, the ring was only five uh, interacting spins. Mm -hmm. But if really, once we, we think in a, in a long chain, that there is no effect that could survive, even when it, uh, the full coherent quantum description will, will show it, it will not be seen in experiments. That's, uh, so that's why I always looking for ro for robust effects to uh, experimentally uh, observable. That's uh, okay. but correct. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you were talking about this distribution of your spins on a Fibonacci Fibonacci. Fibonacci. There was, I don't want to mix things because it all depends on my memory, but there was, there was a paper by less than, less than 15 years ago, more or less, by Alexander Hramov, and then there is a much older paper by Gossard and other people from uh -huh. the labs, when yes. the labs was the labs, and... Uh, in which they had done experiments in which they do, they do make these uh, Fibonacci chains. chains. Yes, yes, yes. In and our common friend, probably Roberto Merlin, was also involved. So Merlin in uh, Ann Hubbard, me, Michigan. Me, yeah, me, yeah, so me. all the people that came from quantum, from optics, I mean, uh, laser yeah, optics and so on. Yes, they, they were. This, uh, for instance, this um, fellow Gossard, uh, he was an artist making those making those experiments. I mean, yeah. they, because they were very very tiny. Uh, and then the gram of is has also the theory. But mm -hmm. that's in two thousand. Yes, yes. Five, six, seven. So for us, I mean that now the, the the Fibonacci was only we put the Fibonacci and the band of random matrix as a, an example. So where to see this diffusive? Uh, because they have the diffusive uh, regime. 
even when it is one dimension, because a typically disordered one dimensional system, you go into localization, and then you don't see diffusion, because the, the mean free path is uh, just uh, half, uh, half of the localization length, so you don't have time to, to see diffusion. So let's say for us was a model, but now that we see the effect, probably, I mean, the long band random uh, matrices are, are even better also, better situations to, to describe experimentally because they could be done uh, many one-dimensional systems like DNA. Yeah, now you can do DNA, for example, doing sequences in DNA. A, B, A, B, you can do build the sequences that you want. And you have a one-dimensional system and you have a sort of long-range interaction. So essentially, to have diffusion, you need correlations and sort of long-range interaction. Thank you. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. For example, if I want to measure uh, the, the inverse participation ratio. Yes. Like, there is a direct way of doing that, not doing like the... the, the <laughs> experimentally? I yeah, don't experimentally. know. I mean, no, I mean, no, 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 I don't think so. Okay. That, uh, until now, they are always uh, theoretical things. Okay, and for example, in, in uh, nuclear physics, uh, because I, as, as far as I know, like the, the NPR like, started in the nuclear physics uh, literature. So how do people in that... Because you cannot... This week, because it was a spin system, and you make the pulse, and well, you make the face of every like spin. Mm -hmm. But in a nuclear system, how you will like get the, the, the I don't know. I've never seen a, an experimental showing of, of the inverse participation ratio. They are always theoretical. So that's I'm happy that I already conceived. We conceived so this 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 way to do with an an talk yeah. to yeah. do an uh, an observable, which is collective in a local uh, thing. That's. That's uh, one of the things that, but you know, otoks are, they are otoks for everything. <laughs> so, and they are not the same. Okay, okay. But thanks. Yes, ah, you want to. I would like to ask you in, the, in your plot of the decay exponent alpha, do you recognize in your quantum diffusive, diffusing, and subdiffusive? Can you say something about the regularity or chaoticity of their system, or your spin system, or you cannot tell anything from that plot? So, it, it really, I mean, uh, from the plot, I, I, I don't, I, no, not from that. So, in the model, I mean, the, the harper hof the it has wigner dyson statistics when you are considering a chain of a length shorter than the localization length, more or less. That's uh, in the region of the transition region. Precisely at the transition, you have this uh, fractal spectrum and so on. But once you are in the localization region just nearby, if you have a chain which is shorter than the localization length, you see wigner dyson statistics in the harper hof tatter But otherwise, I don't see, uh, I still don't know how to catch real chaos in the, in the standard ways to quantify chaos. Okay. Um, and maybe there is also no, not, not much, uh, we didn't try to do the Loj Miteko to, to quantify, uh, to see whether there is a Yapunov exponent uh, of that. But then, uh, clearly for this long range banded random matrix, it is the, the, the spectral distribution is very well established. It is chaotic in, in, the, in, the, in the spectral sense, and it is diffusive in the whole range of parameters around the, the different ex, uh, exponents. So the, is, in connection with chaos there, it is more, more clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I will be available in the time today and tomorrow, and then... I look forward to for questions. Thank you very much.